We're finishing up our series called uh, Diagnosing Your Spiritual Health. And today's question is, are you more sensitive to God's spirit in your life? Are you sensitive to God's presence in your life, uh, to what God is doing? Are, Are you seeing God at work in the world around you? Or are you going through life with spiritual cataracts and you're just not seeing clearly the realities that we live with. So today we are finishing with this question and uh, we're looking at Psalm 139. Uh, It was a uh, passage of scripture that a a man I just appreciate listening to his lectures, he is now gone, but talking about uh, revival throughout Western Europe and North America. Uh, So we're looking at um, at Psalm 139, if you would take your Bibles and turn to that at this time. A a book I wanna recommend, I recommend various resources. The book I wanna recommend is uh, by Dr. Don Whitney, uh, and it is 10 Questions to Diagnose Your Spiritual Health. It's only about yay thick, and it is a great book to help you explore biblical questions uh, to help you grow spiritually. Have you ever wondered how many times you're on camera on a typical day in North America as you walk around? Uh, You know, when you walk into a bank or you're taking your grocery cart back to the corral, uh, you're most likely on camera. Uh, The average American, we're told, is is, uh, on film or digital or otherwise at least 75 times a day. If you move to London, England, that number jumps to 300 times a day. Um, The world is full of whirling cameras capturing capturing our details of life. They're on walls, they're on poles, and yet David tells us in Psalm 139 that we're under much greater scrutiny in our lives than than we are uh, in our daily life. David reveals the secret of understanding ourselves by understanding and knowing the God who knows us. So this morning, I would like to read from Psalm 139, the first 12 verses, and then jump down to verses 23 and 24 and read that. And would you please, in honor of God's word, stand and uh, let me read through that passage of scripture. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in from behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even darkness is not dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Please be seated. What the psalmist wants us to know here is that God knows us inside and out. He sees us from afar, he sees us close up. The psalmist is acknowledging that God knows us better than we know ourselves. He's aware of every action, every thought, every attitude. He anticipates our innermost thoughts. Here in this passage, we see God as being described as active rather than passive. Verse one starts, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Now, the writer of the psalm isn't addressing us, he is addressing God. 
It's his way of saying that he knows that God knows him. And he continues to explore this expansive extent of God's knowledge. Verse two, it says, you know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Is it possible that in the day and age of security cameras and satellites that can focus in on us from hundreds of miles above us, that we simply have lost the truth of this passage? Maybe we have grown so accustomed to being under scrutiny that we hardly notice it anymore. Yet God's knowledge of you and of me is not just expansive, it is deeply personal. David describes God as seeing us from afar, but that doesn't mean that we think God is far away from us. God knows us from the inside. The, the words used here, the language used here is that of perception, that of discernment. It characterizes God's knowledge of us. He discerns what we are doing. You perceive my thoughts. You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with my ways. People tell me I'm a fairly transparent read when it comes to meetings. They can tell when I'm bored, and that's usually because people are asking the wrong questions, pursuing the wrong activities at that point. They can tell when I grow irritated. But my wife, Debbie, who's been married to me for almost 40 years, can, can read me like a book more than others. Uh, she's been around long enough that she can know what I'm thinking even if I try to put a mask on it. But the knowledge God has about you and me is infinitely greater than that. It's not just that he knows us well enough to, to read us from a distance. He knows us so deep that he sees us coming and going. Nothing you do, nothing I do catches God by surprise. According to verse 4, this knowledge is so complete that it is predictive. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. God sees our thoughts before they're fully formed in our minds. I, I suppose that some would raise a question now about prayer. If God knows what I'm going to say, why do I need to pray? Why doesn't he just look into the future, anticipate my thoughts, and grant the answer before I put it into words? In fact, God does that maybe more than you realize. Analyze God's answers to your prayers and you will often discern that what, in order to answer your prayer, things had to be set in motion long before you spoke those words. So often we experience what God has promised to Jerusalem back in Isaiah 65 verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Still, some will say, well, why, why go through the, the charade of, of asking God if he already knows what I'm going to say? Is prayer some kind of game? Is God testing me? Is, is God you know, kind of like that guy who is, who is holding the answer to my desire behind his back and he's waiting for the right words before he brings it out? Uh, all the while knowing that what I want, he can grant the trouble with that view is not only does it represent a bad view of God, an unworthy view of God, the root of the problem misunderstands the purpose of prayer. It assumes that prayer is mainly or primarily functional. It, it assumes that the reason we pray is to get what we want. Now, that might be more true than not in our lives, in the immaturity of our prayer life. If you were to analyze your prayers, would they have more in common with a grocery list than with a conversation? There is more to prayer than the answer. There is more to prayer than the asking. We understand prayer is a relational event. 
In his book entitled Beginning to Pray, Anthony Bloom writes this statement. He says, it is important for us to remember that prayer is an encounter and a relationship, a relationship which is deep, and this relationship can't be forced either on us or on God. And Bloom goes on and he talks about one of the dangers in this area is the temptation of engaging in in, 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 in personal approach to prayer. There, there are many times that we want to pray. There are many things that we may want to say, but we're not ready to meet God. We want something from him, but we don't want him. And that is a problem with our lives when it comes to prayer. We want something, but we don't want God. Think of the times that your prayers have been marked by warmth and intensity. When, prayer, when a prayer concern for someone you love or some matter is important to you, you your heart is open, your inner self is, is recollected in prayer, but does it mean that God matters to you? More often than not, it doesn't. It simply means that the subject matter of your prayer is important to you, not God. So how do we, how do we guard ourselves from this tendency? It's not a matter of methodology. It's not a matter of, of our posture or the words that we, that we use. The real problem is our angle of vision. The problem is that we haven't learned to see God with biblical eyes, to see him as a God who knows me personally, who knows you personally and deeply, a a God that is acquainted with my thoughts, a, a God who speaks my language and anticipates my words. It is a God who knows me better than I know myself. I don't know what I'm going to be thinking tomorrow. But God does. He knows not only my thoughts. He knows the paths that I travel. God knows me. God knows you inside and out. The second thing this psalm teaches us is that God sees us coming and going. Here here the psalmist shifts his focus from God's knowledge to God's presence. And and in a sense, he is changing his perspective for us in this psalm. In verses 5 through 12, the picture isn't on a God who discerns our thoughts from afar, but a God who is close up. You hem me in from behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. The biblical poet here is running into God wherever he goes. Do you ever experience that? Where where you're going through your day and suddenly God is right there with you? Is God behind him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is God in front of him, above, below him? Does God surround him? Yes. David conclude, or conducts a kind of mental experiment here, imagining what it would be like to try to escape from the presence of God. He poses a test question in verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And then he establishes the boundary of this thought experiment in verses eight and nine. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, first he looks at the heights and the depth. Uh, Then he ascends to the high skies above the stratosphere and he finds that God is already there and then he descends into the depths and and he finds that God is already there and and next he explores the expanse of the of the earth uh, the globe if you rise with the sun and fly as the rays of the sun hit the earth and you travel from east to west Uh, all day long crossing the sea, your result is going to be no different. God is there. David concludes that fleeing from God is impossible. Not because God is in relentless pursuit, 
but because no matter where we go, God is already there. Everywhere he goes, he runs into God. Do you experience that in your life? But the psalmist here makes a point, a further point. Not only is God with him wherever he goes, but God is guiding him. Verse 10 says, even your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. How we think about that overall picture depends upon whether you view God as a friend or a foe. We understand God, uh, well, if God were a policeman and his hand is upon you, there is little comfort in that touch. If you've ever been arrested, uh, you don't want that. You would feel different if the hand that rested on your shoulder was that of your best friend. If you're about to slip on the ice, which I do every year in Wisconsin, and a hand grabs you and steadies you, that is reassuring. But if your intent is to run, you feel that grip like a prisoner feels those handcuffs on him or her. You hate it and you wrestle against it. I noticed something about my two sons. They're now both in their 30s. But I noticed something as they moved from childhood into adolescence. They responded differently to my touch when they became teenagers. Uh, when they were little, they seemed eager for a hug. They would, they would jump into my arms and cling to me or, or cling to my legs, and I would walk around with, with one of the boys on each leg. And they enjoyed that time. But when they became a teenager, things changed. Fortunately, they no longer sat on my foot and grabbed my leg. They were just too big for that. Uh, teenagers go through a stage where it's awkward to show affection, but that change is also a symbol of the developing interpersonal interdependence that they're growing. My wife and I used a, a, an analogy of an eagle raising its eaglets. As, as the birds get ready to fly, mom and dad pull all the soft stuff out of the bottom of the nest and it leaves thorns exposed. And the nest is uncomfortable, so the birds go up to the edge of the nest and there they flap and strengthen their wings. The autonomy they, my kids declared by their body language was also being demonstrated in the choices that they were beginning to make. And they stiffened against the constraints that Debbie and I placed on them um, just as they did my embrace. The rules and standards that, that Debbie and I saw as an expression of love and a means of protection, in their immaturity, they mistook as constraints. Which is it for you as you see the strong hand of God in your life? Do you see it as a hand of love or as a hand of an enemy? Is it a source of comfort to you, or is it something that you stiffen against and resist? Does the inescapable presence of God make you feel protected or vulnerable? Is that steady footfall that you hear the mark of a faithful companion or a guide or someone who is guarding your back? Or do you feel that God has laid siege to your soul? Do you see his relentless pursuit as the pursuit of an adversary rather than as a friend? If we're honest, we probably have to admit that, that we're pulled in both directions. David certainly seems that way in this psalm. Uh, he seems a little ambivalent at times. He seems comforted and uncomfortable at the same time. In verses 11 and 12, he seems to imagine what it would be like to hide from God in the darkness of the night. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as a light to you. If you're trying to navigate the unfamiliar territory of life, the unfamiliar landscape in the dark, the thought that God sees clearly can be of great comfort. 
But if you're trying to run from God, you need to understand there is no place that you can hide. No place that you can go that God is not there, that God is not watching. You can't put up a smoke screen that will, will obscure the true state of your heart and your actions. God sees everything with complete clarity. You might be able to fool your neighbor. You can deceive yourself, but you can never deceive God. He knows you too well. He's got your number. He sees you coming and going, and for good reason. He isn't just some heavenly spectator concerning the drama, watching the drama unfold in your life. He is the author. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of your life. So this morning, I want to leave you with four thoughts, and this comes from the book, uh, 10 Questions to Diagnose Your Spiritual Health by Don Whitney. The first principle is go often to the place where God has revealed himself more clearly, the most clearly, and that is the Bible. One of last century's greatest pastors in Great Britain was Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he said this about the Bible. He said, the more we know it and read it, the more it will take us into the presence of God. So if you want to set the Lord always before you, spend time daily reading the truths of God's word. Now, that might seem obvious, but yet there are a number of you here this morning who might purse your lips and nod your head in agreement with that statement, and yet when it comes to your life, you unwittingly put your priority on seeking the presence of God in your experiences rather than the place that Scripture shows to be true. Shouldn't we experience God's presence in the way that he intended us? Last week, I had uh, my students in an undergrad class on the theology of preaching looking at how God deals with us and why language is important. And we understand that God chose to communicate to us through the vehicle of language. And if you know language, you know how culturally dependent it is. And yet God uses human language to make himself known to you and me. But I don't want you to simply read the Bible, close it, and walk away from it. I want you to absorb the water of the word of God. I want you to meditate on it, to mull it over, to think about it, to, to explore its implications and applications for your life. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, you may have what you may have read might be like the rain that evaporates on a hot summer sidewalk. Linger over something so that it forms and it begins to percolate in the soil of your soul and listen long enough until you hear it for what it is, the word of God. The second thing that we need to do is we need to acknowledge God's presence by talking with him. In 40 years of counseling, I don't know how many marriages, I have found that many people or many wives feel uncomfortable when they sit for hours in a room and their husband doesn't say a word. Now understand, two men can go fishing together in a boat back to back, not say a thing all day other than pass me a, a worm, and they will say that's been the best form of communication and togetherness that they have had. Does this develop intimacy? Obviously not from a woman's perspective. But when we allow prayer to come into our, when we allow silence to come into our prayer life, when we don't communicate with God, we ought not to be surprised when we feel separated from God. Now the reality, the truth of God's word is we're no farther away, but because of our behavior, because of our lack of commitment to that relationship, we are not growing in an intimate relationship with God. 
When we talk to God, we feel him closer to us. There is greater intimacy there. People have told me, well, I, I want to recommend to you something that I have been putting out for the last couple of weeks, and I have it in the sermon notes if you pick those up. So either the weekly prayer guide or the weekly sermon notes, and both places have an opportunity for you to practice praying through the passage that is being looked at. Uh, let the words that originated in the heart and mind of God himself become the vehicle to carry your burden to the heart and mind of, of your heart and mind back to God. People have told me so many times that praying God's word brings them into the presence of God like never before. Praying this way makes prayer become more what it ought to be, a conversation with a real person. The third thing that we need to learn is to seek God in the environment of corporate worship. There are things that we learn about God in private worship that we don't learn in corporate worship, but there are also things that we learn about God in corporate worship that we cannot learn on our own. So, the writer of Hebrews would say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some. It will hurt you spiritually if you do. The Bible says that each Christian is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.19 talks about that. But there are many more times when God's word refers to the assembly of believers as the temple of God, the plurality of of worship, of people coming together, and we experience God differently than we do privately. A true church, the word of God is preached. Jesus Christ is presented. The spirit is ministering through diverse gifts. The father is glorified. A solitary worshiper doesn't have access to what takes place on a corporate event. The unique things that happen, that can happen only in a public worship time. Finally, number four, what we need to do is continually affirm the truth that God is everywhere. That God is omnipresent. He has promised us in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always. The strongest promise in the New Testament that I have found is, is found in Hebrews when Jesus, when, when it says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The Lord is with us even when we don't sense his presence. We must, however, reaffirm that truth, even if we don't feel that truth. This will help us to live more by faith rather than by feelings. God seems so far away, my strongest feelings might say to me. It doesn't seem like God knows what is happening or he doesn't care or he doesn't answer my prayers. But faith always responds, God is there. He is here with me. I've appreciated the maturity of Christians that I have sat with over the last four decades as a family member is dying. I remember one woman, when, when her husband of 60 years died, she just silently bowed her head and she said, God, thank you for all the years you have given Paul and me. And I thought that is such a great response to the death of your husband. God is here. He promised that he would never leave me or forsake me. Whether I sense his promise or not, the truth is God is here as much in this moment as he will be at any point, and that is biblical truth. Reaffirming that truth will help us and prompt us to look for more evidence of God at work around us, and this is one reason why I want us as a congregation to take off the the hindrances to our spiritual vision, 
to remove the spiritual cataracts and, and to hear evidence from one another where God is at work because it encourages us. The great fourth century Christian leader, Augustine, one day was accosted by a man who came running up to him. He was holding his idol in his hand and he yelled at Augustine. He says, my God is here. Where is your God? And Augustine calmly looked back at him and he said, I can't show you my God, not because he isn't there, but because you don't have the eyes necessary to see him. Unlike Augustine's opponent, we as followers of Jesus Christ are given the Holy Spirit to enlighten our eyes, to help us see and believe the revelation of God in creation, to see the person of Jesus Christ, to understand this through scripture. It's the way the natural person can't because they are spiritually blind. They are spiritually dead. Those are some of the metaphors used in scripture. However, the fact that we have eyes to see doesn't mean that we are always looking in the right place. In other words, there is often much evidence of God's presence around us than we appreciate. This morning, I want you to try a simple experiment. Look around this room this morning for the color blue. Go ahead, take those peaks. Look for the color blue. When you do, you are in the process of developing blue eyes, eyes that are sensitive to the color blue around you. We need to develop God eyes. We need to develop the sensitivity to see the evidence that we know to be true, namely that God is with us. Look for God everywhere. Look for God in, in the opportunities that you have throughout your life. Say to yourself, the Lord is here, especially in those ordinary places. When you're standing in line at the grocery store, when you're sitting at your desk working on your computer, when you're pumping that gas into your car, uh, when you're, wherever you are, remind yourself that the Lord is present. If you were to visit my home, you would find a lot of clocks and they all chime the Westminster chime. In fact, we have to mute them when we have guests, which is frequent, because our guests often are wake, woken at night. But do you realize that the Westminster chime was originally developed in Cambridge and then adapted into Westminster in London, and it was used by the church to help people remember the presence of God and the importance of prayer. The 16 notes of the, of the Westminster chime also have a prayer with them. It goes like this. Lord, in this hour, be thou our guide, and by thy power may we abide. Now, aren't you glad that it chimes those things rather than has my voice singing? And, you know, I can't help but think that it also reminds me that sometimes people are ding-dongs. <laughs> we really are. In the late, well, in the 1990s, I had a number of classmates who served in a small African country called Rwanda. And between April 7 and July 15, 1994, there was an event called the Rwandan Genocide. Some 1.1 million people were slaughtered during that time. My friends who were there said, because of the mass graves, the ground just oozed blood for months afterwards. Phil and Miriam, Mimi, were two of my classmates. They were working with the church. One day, Mimi is at the church, and a family from the church comes running in looking for protection. And Mimi goes to the door of the church and there an elder of the church is standing with a machete. And his immediate goal is to slaughter and kill the family inside. And Mimi is standing there in the door. And she looks at this leader of her church and she says, you kill them over my dead body. 
And she sees him standing there thinking about that. Years later, a couple by the name of Rick and Kay Warren visited the area, and Kay um, wrote about this. She said, I, I, on, on the first time I visited Rwanda, I, I kept expecting to, see, to, to be easy to spot the monsters who had perpetrated the terrible genocide, and what I found puzzled and ultimately terrified me. Instead of finding leering, menacing creatures, I met men and women who looked and behaved a lot like me. They took care of their families, went to work, chatted with their neighbors, laughed, cried, prayed, and worshiped. Where were the monsters? Where were the evil doers capable of heinous acts? Slowly, with a deepening sense of dread, I realized the truth. There were no monsters in Rwanda, just people like you and me. The good news is that, that the God who is our creator is also our redeemer. The God who knows you inside and out. The God who sees your coming and your going. The God who is the architect of your soul is also the architect of your salvation. He is the God who came in flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who shed his precious divine blood for you. Your creator is also your redeemer. Jesus Christ, the only one who saves us from our sin. And whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook or you're here this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, talk with me after the service or call me during the week so I can share with you from God's word how your life can change, how you can turn from being focused on yourself to being focused on Christ. It is necessary sometimes for God to operate on our heart and you cannot be in a cardiologist's, in a better cardiologist's hands than in the one who designed it himself. God wants to work in your life, maybe to excise that which is hindering you, you from developing and maturing spiritually. Maybe to remove that which is, is making you resist or stiffen against sharing Jesus and talking about Christ with others who need to hear that message of salvation. You need to allow God to make you uncomfortable with the reality of your actions if you're not sharing your faith, where your actions are saying, go to hell, because that's more important than my discomfort. We can't allow ourselves to hold to unbiblical behavior. And we won't when we're aware of the presence of God in our lives. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you know us in and out. We thank you that you are the God, our creator, and the sustainer of life. We thank you, Father, that you are the one who calls us to yourself Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to know you through your word. We thank you, Father, that we can be aware of your presence. So Father, help us through the power of your spirit to have the blinders lifted from our eyes, to see you in your glory, to see us in our response to you, Father, we give you praise and thanks for your mercy that endures, for your love that is capable of helping us live for you. Father, help us to see your presence and to be changed by it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.